Okay. Um, we're going to get started now. Okay, Jeremy's ready to tape. We are being videotaped this evening, and I know that our I know that our <laughs> distinguished poets know they will be taped. When you sign up to, um, to read in the open mic, you are also giving permission to be taped if they do record beyond that. If you do not want to be taped, please like separate your name, perhaps at the bottom. Um, under that, create a heading and separate your name there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for showing up. This is a wonderful gathering. And we have tonight five fabulous poets brought together here by Rebecca Faust. And it's, we really are celebrating that Rebecca Faust is the, um, the re has received the, the, the honor of being the Frost Fellow at Frost Place um, the Dartmouth um, Fellowship Poet in Residence at Frost Place. And um, she is a regular ambassador for Robert Frost, so that uh, a lot of people like myself who only knew a few Frost poems and had him categorized in a little certain way are being educated along the way. She's doing a tremendous job. Um, many of us know Rebecca for her amazing, Amazing work. As soon as she decided to uh, to pursue poetry, she just took it on all the way. And in the last few years, uh, her her work has just been astounding. Her awards, rewards, awards have been astounding. I'm just going to mention a few of her books right now. Um, beautiful book, God Seed was the recipient of a 2010 Forward Book of the Year Award, all that gorgeous pitiless song, Many Mountains Moving Press, recipient of the Many Mountains Moving Book Prize, um, her chapbooks, Mom's Canoe and Dark Card, um, deeply moving. Um, just all of her work is, is gorgeously, thoughtfully layered. Um, they consecutively won Robert Phillips Poetry Chapbook Prizes. Um, she has new poems in Hudson Review and elsewhere. Um, I'm, I'm just going to introduce Becky. We have a lot to cover this evening. It's all going to be fabulous. And so Rebecca Faust, thank you so much. Oh, and then at some point we're all going to get together and channel Robert I, with, with this many spirits here. You think so? Okay. Well, then, okay. You can, you can tell us about uh, the insights that you've gathered so far. Hi, everybody. It's wonderful to see such a full house for our poetry event. Thanks so much for coming out. Thank you, Catherine, for having us. This is a wonderful series. I come when I can. There are lots of people I know in the audience, and. Um, I'm just really grateful for this opportunity. I want to talk very briefly about the Frost Place. In case you don't know about it, they have two summer conferences open to the public, one in July, one in August. Um, the one in August is used to be the, called the Advanced Seminar. It, it tends to be for people that have manuscripts. Each one is a week long. They do offer fellowships, although the time for getting them this year for those conferences has passed. Um, these conferences are run like mini bread loaves, and they use a lot of the same faculty as you find at bread loaf. But there's a big difference. They're not hierarchical, and they don't have any of the kind of meet and greet, uh, po po pro po pro uh, press meet the uh, publisher business. It's all about craft. So they're really wonderful conferences, and I did uh, I did manage to snake a few. Is our Rob here tonight? She she's going to one. Yes, and a few other people. So just maybe put it on your schedule to look at, because they're really good conferences. Um, I'm thrilled to be going there. I'm going to be living in Robert Frost's house in Franconia, New Hampshire, by myself for two months. Um, and I went online and read a few articles about people that had lived there before. And one of them got up in the morning, and there was a bear at the door. <laughs> so it's very rural and remote. Um, <clears throat> so. I also just wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, every time we have one of these frost events, 
we meet resistance from people who think Frost is sort of a has-been or has nothing relevant to say to the modern poetry audience. And there's this idea, in fact, Roy and I have worked up a little dramatic presentation to debunk this notion of Frost as the twinkly cracker barrel New England farmer poet. That's how a lot of people think of him. And it's not surprising that they do, because it's an image that he deliberately cultivated. Um, but there's a lot more to Frost than that. Um, some of you may or may not know that he was born and lived in San Francisco for 11 years. He did a summer in the Casio. Um, his ancestors were from New England, and when his father died, they went back to New England to live with that family. And he did spend the rest of his life there, but he made many, many, many visits back to California. And he wrote many poems about, in, for California. A couple of those I can mention to you are um, Once by the Pacific, Once in a California Sierra, Peck of Gold, Dust of Snow, and Oz Pecks. Those poems are clearly inspired by California. Um, so, yeah, he lived in, in New England, but he also had California connections. This idea that he was sort of an aw shucks, farmer kind of guy, he was a formidable Latin scholar. He was self-taught. He lasted less than a year at Dartmouth and less than two years at Harvard, and he never graduated from college. But he read voraciously and studied seriously, and in the end had so many honorary degrees that he had a quilt made of the hoods. <laughs> and in point of fact, he wasn't much of a farmer. <laughs> he tried chicken farming for a while. He tried raising crops for a while. and. He really never did make a living at being a farmer. Um, about this kind of twinkly folksy quality that he's said to have, our own Kay Ryan said about Frost that he set the standard for management of clarity and darkness. Calvin Trillium is famous for calling Frost the terrifying poet. And Robert Brodsky, in a, a well-known essay that he wrote about Frost, absolutely agreed. He is terrifying in some of his poems. If you've read Out Out, or Home Burial, or Design, you know what I'm talking about. Um, John Berryman loved Frost. At least five of his dream songs mention Frost by name. And I just was doing a little bit of research before this, and this is what the Academy the American Academy of Poets says about Frost, he's anything but, a, but merely a regional poet, the author of searching and often dark meditations on universal themes. He is, quintessentially he is a quintessentially modern poet in his adherence to language as it is actually spoken, in the psychological complexity of his portraits, and in the degree to which his work is infused with layers of ambiguity and irony. This uh, layers of ambiguity and irony is what I'm really interested in. I think maybe the thing I admire most about Pro Frost is that in this age, in our age, where poetry is, is somewhat marginalized and the audience tends to consist of other poets trying to write, I think about a, a poet who could mean as much to people like my mother, who never went to college, as he does to people like Kay Ryan, who did go to college. Um, my mother had many Frost poems by heart. She would uh, say them when she put the laundry on the line, when she rocked me to sleep at night. I grew up hearing those rhythms, and they're part of my DNA. But I think one of the sources of this broad popularity, Laura, you're here. Um, I really think the key to it is in this layering that, that, um, that I mentioned. Frost had a word, Roy doesn't like this word, but Frost called his, he said there was a quality of what he called ulteriority in his work. And it's the notion that there is a, there's a, a surface meaning that is accessible to lots of people, like my mother perhaps, but in every poem there's always something below that. And if you go digging, you can find it. And guess what? If you dig down below that, there's another one, and there's another one. Um, a lot of his most famous poems, like The Road Not Taken or Stopping by the Woods in a Snowy Evening, can be read in completely opposite ways. 
They can be read as optimistic poems or as entirely dark poems. Um, Tim Kendall is one of the Frost scholars that has written a lot about this. Uh, the notion of clear surf surfaces and complex depths, poems that work as well on the surface as they do beneath it. Um, I'm reading Frost's bio right now. Has anyone read this biography that Lawrence Tompkins published in the 80s? He published it after Frost died. He was his official biographer. Three big fat volumes. I have the condensed version sitting on the table back there if you want to have a look. And um, he really presented the good, bad, and the ugly in this thing. And for a while, Frost's reputation suffered because there were a lot of dark sides to him that people weren't aware of. He was immensely ambitious. Uh, he did a lot of self-promotion. But um, what's interesting to me from reading the biography is that this paradoxical quality in his work, I think, springs directly from his character and his life. It's genuine. It's not something he gerrymandered into the poems. There's a tension there that comes from a tension in the person. In any event, his poems can be read on more than one level. And I think that's the reason they appeal to such a broad, broad audience. So I'm going to read one of his poems now, and then I'll read one of my poems. And I'll try to give you an idea of what I'm talking about when I read this poem, after I've read it. How many of you know The Oven Bird? It's my favorite Frost poem. How many of you have heard An Oven Bird? It's, yeah, it's, how would you describe its sound? Otherworldly, it's, it's very hollow and it's, it's loud. And it's loud. Yeah, it's, it's weird to sound. Yes, I would call it strident. It, I would call it a protesting sound. I was going to play it for you guys, but it would take a while to cue it up. The Oven Bird. There is a singer everyone has heard, loud, a midsummer and a midwood bird who makes the solid tree trunk sound again. He says that leaves are old, and that for flowers, midsummer is to spring as one to ten. He says the early petal fall is past, when pear and cherry bloom went down in showers, on sunny days a moment overcast, and comes that other fall we name the fall. He says the highway dust is over all. The bird would cease and be as other birds, but that he knows in singing not to sing. The question that he frames in all but words is what to make of a diminished thing. So I know we're not supposed to talk about what poems mean anymore. But um, I mean, I think this poem is beautiful, even, even if you don't think about what it means. The sounds are very beautiful. The images are beautiful. But when I think about this poem, the line that most perplexes me is this one. The bird would cease and be as other birds. I mean, this had me up all night trying to figure out what he meant by this. Does he mean the bird would die? Or that he would see singing, and then he would be like the other birds? I mean, there are a million different ways you can read that, but it's an example of a line that Frost says in his bio when he is writing, he likes to shoot just over the heads of his readers. He wants you to have to reach a little bit. He doesn't want you to not be able to pull something down, but he doesn't want to make it easy. So that's the line that does that for me. I thought it would be fun to go online, and I did find a forum of people who had read this poem. And I just want to read a couple of, of the reactions to the poem. So one person thought it was a question or a challenge. They said, I'm inclined to see this poem as a question, asking us what we will do with the diminished things in life in order to move on. Another person said, not surprisingly, it was a poem about the fall of man, and there is that biblical reference in there. Another reader thought the poem was Buddhist and about letting go of expectations. Uh, another reader thought the poem was about the death of Frost's children. 
he lost all of his children. Uh, he outlived all of his children. Um, another reader thought the writing was about the, the idea that poetry is superior to prose. This person says, this poem is about the poet and the writing of poetry. I think these might be high school or college kids. It is an exaltation of the poetic form over prose. So that was one person's idea. Another uh, reader thought it was about writing, but they thought it was about Frost's fear that he was losing his edge. Another reader found the poem extremely pessimistic. And basically the idea is that once you've hit midsummer, it's all down there, downhill from there. Another reader thought the poem was extremely optimistic about the challenges we face and how we take them on. Another reader thought it was an uh, echo-political poem. And finally, my favorite, another reader thought the poem was about a bird. <laughs> so now I'm just going to read one poem. And then I'm going to turn the program over to my, uh, the wonderful members of my writing group. And they're going to read, they're going to read a poem about, uh, a poem by Frost, talk about a little bit, and then some of their own poems that have or have not in some ways been inspired by Frost. Um, I'm going to read bird poems in the second half of the program when I come up. But this is a poem that, for whatever reason, feels to me as if it was inspired by Frost. It's called Prodigal, and it's a sonnet, a loose sonnet. Everywhere, all over, mothers have wept into their nightgown sleeves, hoping not to wake those who slept beside them. Cleave blood from blood, and blood will bleed. Let us believe again in waxen wings, titanium ribbed that can bear the sun and never fall, fail. In apostolic things, Lazarus, Lazarus lifting his matted head to sing the blossoms in, loaves and fishes, rain in seasons of drought, species of life that do not wink out one by one like stars. Medea's kids, sung to and snug in their bed. Truth in the news, the world intact in a bead of dew and bound fast again to me, you. So I'm going to turn over the program to Catherine, who will introduce the next reader, and you guys will see me again at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. All right. Um, our first reader is Susan Brown. Um, Susan Brown's poetry has appeared in Plowshares, Subtropics, The Mississippi Review, American Life in Poetry, Writer's Almanac, and many other journals. Her book, which is right back there, in fact, she's got a couple books back there, Buddha's Dogs, was selected as the winner of the Four-Way Books Prize by Edward Hirsch. And her second book, Zephyr, won the Editor's Prize at Steel Toe Books. She teaches at Diablo Valley College in Pleasant Hill and um, offers private poetry workshops. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Susan Brown. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> I'm going to read, um, can you hear me all right? No, all right. Uh, Acquainted with the Night by Robert Frost. I have been one acquainted with the night. I have walked out in rain and back in rain. I have outwalked the furthest city light. I have looked down the saddest city lane. I have passed the, by the watchman on his beat and dropped my eyes, unwilling to explain. I have stood still and stopped the sound of feet when far away an interrupted cry came over houses from another street, but not to call me back or say goodbye. And further still, at an unearthly height, one luminary clock against the sky 
proclaimed the time was neither wrong nor right. I have been one acquainted with the night. So I don't think that's by a, uh, you know, a little farmer guy, you know, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't know what I'm saying there, but I mean, it just, you know, this kind of idea that Robert Frost is not a tremendous influence and poet just seems kind of ridiculous to me. He's a, he's a tremendous influence and a very serious poet um, in every way. Uh, this poem is dark, 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 and that's one of the reasons I love it so much. Um, it doesn't lift up at the end and say all is well, and it doesn't. It has no redemption. I have been one acquainted with the night, and uh, it has a doubleness. I mean, obviously, night is not the literal night. It's it's the night, but it's also the dark night of the soul, and um, you know, isolation and loneliness and sadness. And when I was a young girl. <clears throat> you know, I, 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 little girl, I came to poetry just going, yes, you know, somebody's telling the truth. Wow. Um, and that's because in, in the world that I lived in, I didn't feel like adults told the truth. And that's one of the reasons why I initially came to poetry. Um, the whole truth. And the truth that's about, um, as Bruce Weigel says, make it beautiful no matter what. Um, he, he talks about <clears throat> that that's what poetry does, is that no matter what the subject is, how dark it is, it can still be so beautiful. And that's what drew me to poetry. Um, well, also just the beauty of, of sound and, and, and sense, but, you know, the, the rhythm and the rhyme and the music, which Robert Frost is, you know, a genius at. This poem is a sonnet, on top of being just a tremendous poem in, in its content. It's a sonnet, and it's in ter terza rima, which is an interlaced rhyme scheme that, that Dante wrote all his works in. I've tried to write uh, a poem. <laughs> I wanted to write a poem that I could <clears throat> like that to present tonight, but it's just it's a very difficult rhyme scheme. And um, Anyway, I don't, I, I, it's just a beautiful poem because of its darkness, but also because of its craft, you know, its art, and its, and its singing um, of, of the darkness of the soul. Um, which I, <clears throat> which I'm so attracted to, because we don't. Poetry is up to that. Poetry is up to that challenge, and I don't feel like prose often is. Um, poetry is, is able to do that. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'll read a few a few of my own poems. <clears throat> this is from Buddhist Dogs, and I'll try to go along with that dark theme, just darkness, desolation. <laughs> Sadness and loneliness. There's no alcohol here either. <laughs> Just brutal. We're good. We're ready for it. And I think we should hear it even better. So I'm gonna... Oh. All right. Oh, just stand away a little bit. All right. All right. Oh, come stand back a little. Closer. All right. The yard. <laughs> the yard. My mother's car was there behind the chain link fence. Among rows of cars, no one got out of alive. The front half of the roof smashed down to the seats. The back, a hole torn by the machine called the jaws of life. Blood stains rusted into the metal where the window had been on the driver's side. Her Chrysler LeBaron now indistinguishable from the other wrecks. A Doberman slunk around crushed fenders blown tires, doors hanging open or ripped away. Glass glinted on the seats, glass scattered like a fine and radiant dust on the ground. No wind, no sound. The dog quietly malevolent, guarding the yard on Pedrick Road, a strip of cracked concrete heading south into weeds with a panoramic view of the flat earth, where people fall off and do not come back. <clears throat> and then for another happy poem. Life is too hard is the first sentence I read when I'm finally in bed 
after driving for five hours in a rainstorm after the funeral of my brother-in-law. I nod at the sentence like an old friend and down a paragraph again at a major disadvantage to living is death. Then realize I'm reading a satire and start chuckling quietly because I'm next to my husband who is sleeping like the dead after working 16 hours. So I tap him on his arm and he flinches and my heart returns to its normal labor. But when I read why we were brought into the world only to suffer and die is an area of research in which much remains to be done. I laugh hard, practically falling on the floor, holding my stomach, my shoulders shaking, and wander through the dark rooms of the house, chortling and hiccuping, bumping into a chair that looks different, lumpy and dented, and where is the end table? Did we throw it out? Something is missing. Something is wrong. I sit on the couch, hunched over as if I'm still driving through the rain. My brother-in-law will not be here again, ever. In the bathroom, I stare at the towels that need to be washed, laughing a little between gasps in order to stand it. <clears throat> and then a bird poem. And it is about a bird in my backyard, my very backyard. A robin with ragged wings perches on the edge of the roof, chirping feebly to the sky, his head turned at an odd angle as if his neck is broken. And some of his feathers look like the cat tried to saw them off with her claws. He's about to die any second, but he doesn't stop his song reminding me of the many on earth who ask and never receive. I stand by the window wondering how I can help, searching the apple tree for his buddies to come save him. I go outside for a closer look. He's gone. The yard is weirdly quiet without that wretched singing. And then I'll just read one more. And it, and it is very uplifting. <laughs> at the end. <laughs> you have to suffer all the way through it. No, I'm just kidding. It's, it's not a very long poem. <laughs> um, let's see. In the art gallery, the painting of flowers next to the painting of flames. And I remember that time years ago when the psychiatrist said, you feel too much. You are too sensitive. Take these, giving me a bottle of pills. I took them to the beach, watched light become flame on the water, and along the ragged cliffs, small flowers like blue stars, the world a painting I couldn't live in. I opened the bottle, then put it down, pills spilling on the sand, Waves carried the flames and didn't mind the burning, the arising from and disappearing into the vastness. I swam, let the waves take me, then treaded water looking at the sky, a silver tray full of the most beautiful nothing. I swam back, the water was black. I could sink beyond caring, but I wanted to live to be there with the beauty and the burning and let it be too much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, our next reader is Susan Cohen. Um, and Susan has, um, has been an award-winning journalist and then has moved into a, what has become her primary love poetry and is also doing beautiful, beautiful work. Um, her awards include the 2013 Milton Kessler Memorial Prize for Poetry, 
um, and recent poems are appearing or forthcoming in Hunger Mountain, Los Angeles Review, Poet Lore, Poet, Poet Lore, excuse me, Salamander, and the Bloomsbury Anthology of Contemporary Jewish American Poetry. Um, she is the author of a beautiful full-length book of poems entitled Throat Singing, and we have copies of that in the back. I'm very pleased to introduce Susan Cohen. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I always love to read here. And thank you, Becky, for this assignment, which is the way I looked at it, um, for organizing this. And, you know, it was really um, interest, an interesting challenge to look back through Robert Frost's work and then with that in mind to, to look through some of my own. And, uh, well, with some humility, look through some of my own. Um, so I'm going to start by reading Fire and Ice, a poem that I'm sure you all know, and, but it, because it's my favorite and because I just think it's one of the best poems about hatred ever written in the English language. So Fire and Ice. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. <laughs> so um, then I was going to read uh, Stopping in the, in the Woods on a Snowy Evening, but um, that suggestion was met with a lot of groans. Um, you know who you are, Meryl, and other people. <laughs> and I realized it was because Everybody of a certain generation already has that by heart. And so um, that led me to look for a poem uh, that was not known. And I found one I had never read, um, and uh, I was amazed by it. And part of what's interesting is uh, I tend to think of Frost's landscape as domesticated farms and walls and apple trees. And uh, this clearly takes place in an undomesticated landscape. And uh, just to set you up for it, uh, you know, a man is alone in the wilderness. He hears nothing but his, his own voice echoing, and then he has this encounter. And it's called The Most of It. He thought he kept the universe alone. For all the voice and answer he could wake was but the mocking echo of his own from some tree-hidden cliff across the lake. Some morning from the boulder, uh, boulder-broken beach, he would cry out on life that what it wants is not its own love back in copy speech, but counter-love original response. And nothing ever came of what he cried, unless it was the embodiment that crashed in the cliff's talus on the other side, and then in the far distant water splashed, but after a time allowed for it to swim, instead of proving human when it neared, and someone else additional to him, as a great buck it powerfully appeared pushing the crumpled water up ahead and landed pouring like a waterfall and stumbled through the rocks with horny tread and forced the underbrush. And that was all. And that was all. <laughs> so um, thinking back to what Becky said, what does he mean by all? And the title, the most of it, what does he mean by most? What does he mean by it? So um, Robert Frost and me, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think it's his rhythms, really, that have stuck with me uh, because I learned them so young, uh, his music. And um, 
so much so, it has three or four or five beat iambic lines, and so much so uh, that when I first came to writing poetry seriously 15 years or so ago, I tried to purge my work of that because uh, it came so naturally and because it seemed to me maybe it was a little old fashioned sounding. And um, I thought I had done it, and to my surprise, when my book came out, uh, a, a few months back, it was reviewed, and the first thing the reviewer noted was, uh, and praised, was were my four or five beat iambic lines. <laughs> so there you go. It is part of my poetic um, DNA, as Becky put it, and uh, I have to own up to it. So, um, so it was interesting to look back through my work with that in mind, and, uh, and I found that it's, it was most prevalent in narrative poems, somehow when I get into storytelling, I just really go into that rhythm. So this is a, a poem from my book, and then I'm gonna read a few uh, newer ones. L and interestingly, this led me to poems I don't usually read, so. Lucky Dog. My family bragged during my childhood that we owned a dog who smiled. Mutt of memory, spring-loaded, black-coated. When I whistled, she came bouncing. Sometimes she arrived unbidden, all unleashed delight. She'd track me to the schoolyard, leap to lick my chin, knock me flat onto the blacktop. Suburban evenings on my bike, I heard neighbors calling. Their dogs never came. We had our lucky dog. They had sour marriages, dour jobs, common cancers no one named with children present. At the time, I didn't wonder if our lucky mutt was one part hound, some part myth, like so much that I was taught of happy ever after. I just knew she made me nervous when she pitched into my ribs. Already life seemed more complex than promised. Affection, excitable and fluid as a high voltage tail that sometimes whipped across bare legs and stung. I'd done nothing to deserve her generous tongue that slopped its unrelenting happiness on me. So maybe I didn't trust in her, not fully, not even then that lavish, bounding luck, that doggy grin. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, some newer poems, and again, um, uh, hearing that rhythm in, in narrative, uh, Catherine mentioned I was a journalist, and this poem is called Repertorial. I met them young and frightened. It was San Francisco in the 80s. In the Castro, the last bitter Irish bar held out against their gayness, and boys who had survived a father's belt, boots to the ribs, bottles smashed against their skulls, showed a different kind of bruising, smacked purple by a cancer that spoiled their handsome faces. Some seemed baffled by the microbes in their brains. I came to them as a reporter, and they'd offer up their stories with a cup of coffee I would sip to show them their saliva did not scare me. I remember one. His army jacket hung on a frame that had carried twice the weight. Now he was a hanger for his coat. We talked in a cafeteria, and then he stood and hugged me too hard for a stranger. He was a tall man in his twenties, who needed me to know he was not a ghost yet, and clung as if I were the raft to save him. Or as if, and I'm still sorry, sorry I imagined, face pressed against rough cloth and the sharpness of his shoulder, he almost hoped to give me his disease, a reason to remember how he felt. birding by ear. We're mostly couples of that age when people start to wonder what, what they've missed and set out to find it evenings at adult school. 
Our teacher, slim, blonde, single, fine at snatching bird song from air. Amazing, really, not to mention younger. And I notice how men gaze at her, intense as sharp shinned hawks, and consider their life lists. <laughs> What's the harm? My husband and I met so many birds ago. When he came fresh from the Southern California orchard, bearing the exotic names of cherries, bings, vans, jubilees, lamberts, tartarians, black republicans. His childhood of droughts and floods, rich in one way. His father paid him to shoot those birds that ate the crop. In their taxonomy, the avian kingdom divided neatly into damned cherry eaters and birds allowed to live. A cherry eater chirped. The boy ran to the orchard. He plugged thousands at a nickel apiece. Bounty hunter, 22 slung, where now he hefts a spotting scope and aims at nothing more than magnification. No wonder he impresses her, birding by ear, until that day when he admits his crimes. She begins to list some species, faltering, as she asks, not Western tanagers. <laughs> My Audubon, who slaughtered everything to paint a more perfect feather, but could be forgiven because of the beauty he made visible. The way I see beauty in my husband's need to tell a sometimes awkward truth. Our teacher, though, responds to the nod with silence, and her eyes dart to her feet as if someone's dropped a sack of tiny corpses. <laughs> and uh, I'm just going to finish up with a uh, lyric poem uh, that somehow um, appealed to me after reading uh, the most of it. And um, for those of you who, who don't know, godwits are surf, it's a, a surf bird that gathers in huge flocks. Uh, Credo. I don't believe in God, but I do believe in Godwits. How they give up the shore to stream by hundreds, to be one feather on the same fluid body. How they swing over the water, this way and that, a loose boom of birds, flare right or snap left, visible, golden, invisible, as sun catches or releases them all. A semaphore wink from the deck of the ship, bearing no message but spark. I believe then, at least, existence is a marvelous trick of the light as the godwits keep flocking, seen, unseen, seen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. This is just a wonderful group of people, and I'm, I'm thinking how fortunate, how wonderful to, that Rebecca has brought you all here for us, but how fortunate you all are to have each other. Just really wonderful poets all. So next we have Roy Mash, and um, I was about... <laughs> And then I realized this was quite unfair when I came across the list of the poem that you are to read, but um, that I loved your description of what Frost was doing in the poem with the line of ants, whose title I've forgotten, obviously, but... Okay, departmental. At any rate, we might use it to urge people to go to the site and listen to the wonderful um, bit that, that Rebecca and Roy did together on the radio about um, different views of Robert Frost. And in this one case, they discussed their very different perspectives on this poem, and it was just fabulous. All right, so uh, Roy Nash is a, a, such a dedicated and, and um, active, wonderful poet who's been a longtime board member of the Marin Poetry Center. And he has very recently published his first full-length book, Buyer's Remorse, 2014. And it is at the back table 
I'm um, just really delighted that he's here and part of this reading, and so I'm going to let him take it on. Roy Mesh. Uh, thanks, Catherine, and thanks, Becky, for putting this together. This is uh, just wonderful. This was a good opportunity for me as well to revisit uh, Robert Frost. And in going back over the poems, it, it struck me how much he's the master of the extended metaphor. So you got the roads, you got the woods, the end of the world with fire and ice or birches. The entire poem is like one long elaborated metaphor as opposed to what's much more common today, I think, is the discrete metaphor, the hit and run metaphor. It just takes the space of a line or maybe two in most poets, including myself, to the extent that they use metaphors, um, indulge in the uh, discrete or hit and run metaphor. Uh, the poem I'm uh, going to read tonight of Frost's is Mending Wall one of the extended metaphors par excellence. And in this case, the wall, of course, is the metaphor, uh, but for what? Uh, is it a psychological wall, a political wall? And also, what is the attitude of the poem versus the wall. This is the, the poem that has the famous line, good fences make good neighbors. And I spent most of my life thinking, well, yeah, he's making fun of good fences make good neighbors. The line, something that doesn't love a wall, seems to be an idea that the poem likes. Until I came across this alternative interpretation that said, no, 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 the poem is really endorsing the view that good fences make good neighbors. And I'm thinking, what? Um, but uh, in fact, a lot of people actually do take that interpretation, and you can decide for yourself. This is also a poem that, for the most part, uh, is choose the discrete hit and run metaphor, you get a couple of them, like the stones are like loaves, or it's a game, uh, two on a side. But for the most part, there are not individual metaphors within the poem. It's just um, a long metaphor. Mending wall. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen groundswell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun, and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. The work of hunters is another thing. I have come after them and made repair, where they have left not one stone on a stone. But they would have the rabbit out of hiding to please the yelping dogs. The gaps, I mean, no one has seen them made or heard them made. But it's spring mending time. We find them there. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill. And on a day we walk to meet the, we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go. To each the boulders that have fallen to each. And some are loaves, and some so nearly balls. We have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. We wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game. One on a side. It comes to little more. There, where it is, we do not need the wall. He is all pine, and I am apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. He only says, good fences make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion into his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it 
where there are cows. But here, there are no cows. Before I built the wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. I could say elves to him, but it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand, like an old stone savage armed. He moves in darkness, as it seems to me, not of woods only in the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father's saying, and he likes Having thought of it so well, he says again, good fences make good neighbors. So that was Mending Wall. Um, moving on to a few of my own. I, I, as I say, I don't have that many poems of my own that are extended metaphors. I, I do have a few, and I'll, I'll read a couple here. Um, the first is called Tuesday, and its main image and metaphor is uh, that of a muffin and eating a muffin. Tuesday. In mid-bite, the way the body of the muffin suddenly crumbles, the palm frantic, juggling the fragments, the way you may feel your life come apart, say, on a Tuesday. Feel it buckle, then crumple. The sick avalanche of surprise. Um, that's a poem, by the way, that just captures a particular moment. Uh, Susan Cohn at one point, I think, said one of her teachers said there was a point in time when poets started writing about moments in time as opposed to longer ideas, and I had never really thought of that. Uh, but here's a, another poem of a moment. Uh, this is called Making the Bed, and it's really just about that moment when you've just put out the sheet above the bed, making the bed. There's a moment after the sheet's been snapped, cast into a bosomy sky before it lapses in a shambles at your knees. When it seems as if it's going to amble perfectly, consolingly down, like a hand on a troubled shoulder, a fatherly hand that grows gentler, featherier with nearness, promising falsely. Everything's okay. Everything's okay. Um, another a poem, I suppose this is a, of a kind of moment. This poem is called, They'll Never Find Me Here. It's uh, inspired by those newspaper articles you sometimes read uh, involving a game of hide and seek gone horribly wrong. And uh, I should say about this poem also, this is one of the poems where the title serves not as the first line of the poem, as often happens, but as the last line. So although I won't say it for you, I encourage you to say to yourself sato voce, as it were, after the, le the poem is ended, it's just a length of a sonnet, uh, the title, They'll Never Find Me Here. 
a paragraph, half paragraph really, tucked back with the local items. Some boy, some clever boy, somebody nobody knew, somebody certainly not me, none of which ever stopped me from thinking myself into the fridge in the far lot down by the rusted out pier or making my way back, back before the reek of shit, back before the stupid, 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 before the kicking, the keening, the crazed calling out, back before the black surround and the seal like a kiss, before its sound, to that instant of whispered glee, that one heart surge of delight and exaltation. The last poem I will read is, uh, I suppose, a poem also of a moment. Uh, sometimes you get up in the morning, or I do, and I'm just pissed off at the world. And the first thing I see becomes the object for all my rage and irritation. So this poem is called Pants. <laughs> How inhuman they appear this moment. Their loony ductwork rising to the illogical crotch. The absurd, absurd plurality of them. The inseam alone is an abomination. The zipper rippling, millipedal, impossible to believe anyone ever, ever cooked such things up. Take the yodel or the Elizabethan ruff accordioned about a courtier's neck, like a poodle cut. Oddities no more preposterous than this platypus of apparel, <laughs> emerging just now from the primordial soup of the clothes pile onto the stark surface of awareness. For two full minutes, I tisk at the creation of the belt loop, the undeserved demise of the toga, the singular goofiness of cuffs. And we who go into them Feet first, each morning, sitting on the edge of the bed, or stooped to ladle the paraphernalia of our sexes into the bladder chamber, <laughs> dangling just there about the shins. We who furrow our legs into their legs, fork ourselves over to their keeping, down to the last follicle. Are we not too silly, silly creatures proliferating in our corduroys? Swaddled and monstrous and perfectly crazy for the cha-cha. 
Thank you, Roy. All right. Um, our final uh, reader tonight, and then we will return to Rebecca, um, who's going to kind of bookend this Robert Frost evening. Our final reader among the, the group is um, Jean Wagner. And she she's written six books of poetry, or five books, five collections of poetry, including the very um, beautiful In the Body of Our Lives, which was published by Sixteen Rivers Press and is also on, no, it's not. Well, perhaps someone has a copy. They can at least show around. Um, at any rate, uh, Jean Wagner has received several national awards, including in uh, 2013, the Thomas Merton Poetry Award, Poetry of the Sacred Award. Um, her poems have appeared in many journals, Alaska Quarterly Review, Cincinnati Review, American Life and Poetry, and she is on the editorial staff of California Quarterly. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Jean Wagner. I'm still thinking about that illogical crotch. <laughs> so fascinating. Um, the poem I'm going to read tonight, can everyone hear me OK, is After Apple Picking. And it's a poem I loved even long before I started writing poetry myself. Um, I've heard that it isn't cool to talk about what poems mean anymore, but um, I don't believe in that. Um, what I love about this poem, it, on one level, the obvious level, it's kind of like the old man river thing. I'm um, tired of living and scared of dying. Uh, but beyond that, I love the way this poem is really about the burden of seeing and the burden of consciousness, the way we have to pick it and sort it and store it into memory. And then there's that wonderful image in the middle about that circular piece of ice in the trough, which is like a lens. And after that image, it goes into a kind of into the dream state and then back again. A fantastic poem. It's even got the apple as, you know, the legend of the fall. Everything's in here. After apple picking. My long, two-pointed ladders sticking through a tree toward heaven still. And there's a barrel that I didn't fill beside it. And there may be two or three apples I didn't pick upon some bough. But I am done with apple picking now. Essence of winter sleep is on the night. The scent of apples. I am drowsing off. I cannot rub the strangeness from my sight. I got from looking through a pane of glass. I skimmed this morning from the drinking trough and held against the world of hoary grass. It melted, and I let it fall and break. But I was well upon my way to sleep before it fell, and I could tell what form my dreaming was about to take. Magnified apples appear and disappear, stem end and blossom end, and every fleck of russet showing clear. My instep arch not only keeps the ache, it keeps the pressure of the ladder round. I feel the ladder sway as the boughs bend, and I keep hearing from the cellar bin the rumbling sound of load on load of apples coming in. For I have had too much of apple picking. I am overtired of the great harvests I myself desired. There were ten thousand thousand fruit to touch, cherish in hand and let fall. For all that struck the earth 
no matter if not bruised or spiked with stubble, went surely to the cider apple heap as of no worth. One can see what will trouble this sleep of mine, whatever sleep it is. Were he not gone, the woodchuck could say whether it's like his long sleep as I describe its coming on, or just some human sleep. Uh, one of the things about this poem is that it's rhymed. Uh, and in the traditional sense, it's end rhyme. But in his own sense, it's end rhyme because he stops. He jams it every time he gets a rhyme, so it's very hard to rhyme, to uh, read. Some of the lines are only uh, two words long because they're going to rhyme with another word that's um, a couple lines down. So in a way, this was very innovative when it was written. And I've tried to copy that style, but I decided you don't have to stop. Just because it rhymes, you can continue that line on and on. Um, the poem, I'm, one of the poems I chose tonight, because I thought it's a little like that theme of um, the burden of consciousness, but this isn't a metaphor of picking, but a metaphor of trying to sustain words and thought and, and communication. Um, I don't just sustain metaphor, I kind of, you know, beat it till only the legs are twitching. <laughs> <laughs> this one is called Going for the Juggler, which I always heard as going for the juggler, coming as I do from a family of jugglers, unlike others who are taught from an early age to keep their distance when things are in motion. For example, when words are flung out with such precision, such finely controlled force, they vanish into pure trajectory, filling the air with a whooshing sound like silk, shifting against a woman's skin. The art of juggling begins slowly, first with the proverbial rings, then hunting knives, tiki torches, Indian clubs with their head over heels gravity. Some things are, after all, a matter for gravity. They long to be held aloft, to be spared their eventual failing. But there should be levity, too, and joy in the mastered rhythms. I've learned every orbit is sacred, to disrupt one a sacrilege, a nearly irresistible urge. Think of the atom. Think of the earth circling the sun. Think of the elliptical language of jugglers. Imagine working the five ball cascade, shapes and colors melding in a chorus of motion, everything you ever loved, wheeling away from you, then returning. That was actually, that was a prose poem, I should have said it. So in contrast, this second poem um, I brought, which is, I only brought two, is a um, villanelle. And it's called My Father Was a Detective. Actually, he wasn't, but whenever he'd catch me out at something, he'd say, I'm a detective. <laughs> My father was a detective. Detection is the heart of science, he always said. Listen to the way the wind maligns the trees. Study the shaded landscape of the morning bed. Look for pressure points and touch. The wary tread of footsteps, a whirl of fingertips. Try to tweeze clues from the dead. It's a science, he always said. Don't listen to the words, but to the pause instead. Suspect the compliant one who too readily agrees to smooth the sheets and cover up the morning bed. Have an eye for absence, erasure, whatever has fled. If a hand caresses, look for stains on the sleeve. Detection is the heart of science, he always said. Ransack the house, dig up the yard, and dredge the lake. Empty the teacup and read its leaves, then the sheets, the covers of the morning bed. To find the spider, first make a map of its web, the span of the weft, the warp in what it leaves. 
Detection is the heart of science, he always said. Study the sheeted landscape of the morning bed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. All right, and so I'm very, very happy to bring Rebecca Faust back to yep, finish to up. Bring back Ross. <laughs> I hope there are um, some birders in the audience. Any birders? Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, when I was trying to um, decide which of my poems to read, well, I read The Oven Bird first, and I just thought, oh, I should look at some of my bird poems, and, and I was really kind of surprised to see how many there were. So the, the poem I'm going to start with is called Prompt. Um, I saw uh, or heard Stephen Dunn read a while ago. I think Roy was with me at Francesca's house, and he uh, talked about the, um, he has a book called Refs, Riffs and Reciprocities. They're all little prose poems. And he said that his prompt that he gave himself for writing those poems was to, this was it, write only what you absolutely do not know. So that got me thinking, and it started writing this poem. And, and I am going to read poems with birds. We're going to have geese, a huya bird, and, and uh, magpies. Prompt. Write only what you absolutely do not know. Not what you are merely not sure of, but what you know for sure you do not know. Nothing and everything. What happens after death or before? Where my old dog is now. My mother. My father. Not the clumped ashes, but the mad licking and tail beating the dense gaze of irisless eyes. Dad's delight in anything red. Mom's bare feet when she ran out, not wanting to miss the landfall migration of Canadian geese, raft after dark raft aloft in the gray sky. We knew without asking why she left the dinner table an acre of feather and beak seethed and blotted up the dark lake and no sound but the high cry. Um, this next poem I'm going to read is about the huia bird. Anybody know about the huia bird? Have you ever heard of it? It was a, a bird that was very common in New Zealand until... Um, its popularity for ladies' uh, headwear and brooches um, drove it out of existence. And it is gone now. And uh, the artist who did the um, illustrations for this book, she'd hate to hear me say illustrations, but the art for this book, she was uh, fascinated by this bird and, and has done a lot of work with it. This is called Last Bison Gone. Ours is the curse of the blighted touch that wilts every green shoot and flower we mean to admire, keep, recreate, or improve. New Zealand's huia bird, prized for her scimitar beak and pleated Victorian petticoat tail, was hunted extinct, except for this diving belled brooch and sad hat band, fast falling to dust in the Smithsonian. We love what we love in the scientific way, empiric, vicious, too much, and always we touch it, our breath blooming algae on the walls of Lascaux, shimmering in acid etch green. So that line is a reference, you probably already know this, but the, the caves in France that were discovered by the little boys in the 40s with the incredible cave drawings, they've had to reseal them because so many people were so excited and went down to see them that their expiration, their breathing out, uh, raised the humidity and allowed the growth of this 
paint eating algae that was actually eating the paintings off the walls. So they have now resealed those those caves. And if you go to visit Lascaux now, you visit a, a facsimile. It's not the real deal. So I thought that was uh, an interesting commentary. Even the things we love, we can't help destroying. Um, the last poem I'm going to read is also a bird poem. It has magpies in it. Um, I had the great good fortune to hear William Kittredge read and Sherman Bitsui read on the same night. Um, Sherman Bitsui is a Native American, and he was reading poetry lamenting the cultural extinction of his people and the loss of their lands, and followed very dramatically by William Kittredge, who was raised by ranchers, and he grew up in the Pacific Northwest, and these were big-time ranchers that used big-time machinery and big-time broad-spectrum pesticides like malathion. And uh, he told a story before one of his readings that really stuck with me, and that story is the basis of this poem, Day. It was about his grandfather. Day. Each day at dusk, a man drove his old truck to the barn to shoot the magpies he'd trapped there, in a cage there. Asked why, he said, because I can. And when he used malathion in that green valley, every last songbird died in one light dappled morning, in one tenth of a day. So I think I'm going to close with another short poem by Frost, and then we have a special treat if our technology works. Um, we talked about Frost's dark poetry, um, and Susan stole my favorite Frost poem, Reading Acquainted with the Night, which is quite dark. I, I really urge you, if you haven't already, to read Out Out and Home Burial. They're too long for, for me to read tonight. But I'm going to read this short sonnet called Design. How many of you know it? Isn't it a creepy poem? It's like a great Halloween poem, right? I found a dimpled spider, fat and white, on a white heel-all, holding up a moth, like a white piece of rigid satin cloth. Assorted characters of death and blight, mixed ready to begin the morning rite. Like the ingredients of a witch's broth, a snowdrop spider, a flower like a froth, and dead wings carried like a paper kite. What had that flower to do with being white, the wayside blue and innocent heel all? What brought the kindred spider to that height, then steered the white moth thither in the night, what but design of darkness to appall, if design govern in a thing so small? Okay. I hope this works, and those of you who are sick of stopping by the woods on a snowy evening may leave the room. Thank you so much for listening. Oh, and there's lots of Frost books on the back table. I've kind of brought some of my collection, and there's Frost Place materials back there, too. Feel free to grab some.
Yes, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Jean, Roy, Susan, Susan, wonderful, wonderful evening. So please help yourself to brownies and schmooze a little bit, buy a few books. We're going to take a very short break, I mean like seven minutes. We'll start the open mic and people, uh, we're going to move it along very quickly, one poem per person. Okay. Okay, I think we're going to start up our open mic here. Uh, go ahead and grab a brownie or a book or whatever, but we're going to get started. All right, uh, John Oliver Simon. You can um, stall. Oh, I can stall totally a can. If the um, people talking about poetry in the back of the room would. Uh, make their way to their seats and because uh, I really want Becky Faust to hear my poem so <laughs> if you're talking to her about life and Robert Frost thank you this is a um, a brief non-fiction novel in sonnet form. <laughs> the novel of Ernest, how he met Francis and Bunny passing out leaflets at a march down 6th Ave to Union Square in defense of the Spanish Republic, how her blonde laughter lofting smoke into canyons of Manhattan, and Bunny's wry wit, which did not spare Stalin, were an oasis of gaiety, so that very shortly he was crashing on their couch. Ernest slept with each of them sequentially, providing them briefly with what they needed, Bunny to be wanted, Francis understood and then moved on. Did he, in fact, go to Spain fighting with the Abraham Lincoln Brigade? Was not my father. Francis was definite. Thank you. Meryl Natchez, Net, Natchez, Natchez. Well, I was going to read a bird poem, but it's late. There's a lot of people who are going to read, so I'm going to be short and hopefully a little funny. Ode to Cheating. <laughs> who hasn't cheated a pit? Slipped the office pen into the personal pocket? Relished the piece of toast not on the diet? Or when monitoring your progress, shade the numbers just a fraction? And to cheat on your partner makes the sex much hotter. Everyone cheats on their taxes. Cheat on the test, cheat at cards, cheat your friend, cheat on the lover you're cheating on your partner with. The batter uses steroids, the boxer takes a dive, the broker makes insider trades. As a child, you first learn the thrill of it, the deliciousness of risk, that you can put one over, the power to deceive, balanced with the shame of getting caught, heat rising to your face. What contempt we have for Nixon, 
a man who cheated even at golf. You have to cheat to know that utterly slimy feeling, you underhanded, double-dealing, deceitful wretch. You're a dishonor to your race. How could you? Really? How could you not? <laughs> Thank you. Rob Lipton. So I've, I'm setting this up, uh, this manuscript, as I'm using some a, like scientific abstract as a kind of a trope to get me into a poem sometimes. Waiting for the commercial break, abstract, objective to quell hope in the face of undeniable happiness. Methods use military grade noise production systems to establish the boundary silence is often mistaken for God's voice. Results, a man of some cloth mistakes the microphone switch with the bomb release. He asks for a dab of sunblock. Conclusion, music has more penetrating power than purely gastronomic ordinance. Geography only matters when betraying friends for the sake of an easy commute from the bombing run. Okay. Two comfortable red, two aquamarine, aquamarine couches, folding chairs, proportionally tasteful altar, candles, robin's egg, blue ceiling, and dark hardwood roof supports. The soprano sang and the baritone switched off with the children's choir on amazing grace. This man who did many things well, this man with a great ostrich egg of a head and even eyes, wife, aging, while he remains uncreased, fills a sun-dappled Unitarian church. There is the one earring college interview, the friend's list of funny yet poignant, in quotation marks, he hold the dog upside down, gargle yogurt, sketches, sage aphorisms, the midlife kindness of a man, still fairy tale loved by blood, by the pulpit, Beside the choir, there is the wooden box full of sweetbreads, 200 pounds of organic matter, the dancer's body uninhabited by dancer, the baritone again, the fantastic green light emanating from the fingertips of all the mullahs saying burial prayers for the children in the third house down on Jerusalem Street. Five white swaths, as if being sold at auction behind the family, the ululations in the roar of tactical aircraft, 50,000 horsepower in one glaring fighter, fighter pilot. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Alice Kepsha. Um, I did not read the brochure, so I didn't bring a Robert Frost poem. Um, what do bugs have to do with love? My uh, poem is called Entomology and Marriage. As a moth to light, lips seek lips. As a moth to light, we slowly kiss. As a moth to light, oh what fun, the kiss lasts, the time comes. Husband and wife, we love all day and into the night. In sickness and in health, we learn to fight. To the bloody marrow of our lonely bones, silent rock of a husband and stony wife. But we silently reminisce the sweetness of our lips, and our lemony kisses, though our remembrance is perversely a little bit bittersweet. Thank you, Jeannie Lupton. Tonka. Seismic retrofit at senior housing. Noise and dust for the rest of some people's lives. <laughs> Thank you, Jeannie. All right, I'm Sally Ellsby. 
I think she may have left. All right. Okay, Claude, Claude Convert. Oh, I tr think I said her name the best I ever have. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Powder Works Writers Group. Okay, hi. So tonight, just to say this real quick, we're going to present um, or share a trio of poems. Um, this time, our theme was the Albany Bulb, which is our local public beach. There's been a lot of political controversy. And so we took an article from the street sheet, and all of our poems use words directly lifted from this article. That was our premise. Um, I'm Zoe Francesca, I'll go first, then Audrey Sable, and then Amy Appel. After Dismantle. Almost Albany, do not continue. Abundance, landfill materials, all and, and income social. The be to, well, be and have, I hear have here asserted gardens for themselves. Would city help a civil restraining, evicting, matter, money, stay? That with our animals, continue human. Cities housing said, dump people nowhere. Turn to feel who their construct disapprove. Gaining from and not needs. Flamingos and pieces. Trying to happening. Lovers determined. Protect so, so people. My Twiggly's Tree. Near six years I've spent in this Albany settlement, half nature, half art, all heart, a bulb of lamps at night till we're all tucked in tight. I ran away from Jackson County 10 years ago when I was 12, moving fast and last headed for my uncle's trailer at Delval. When I heard about this place on the bay from a couple I met at Circle K, Miller and Butterfly, who'd come out from Texas together they watched out for me, showed me a trail to my own home, a tree house I dreamed of since I was three, just like the one in my favorite old book, Miss Twigley's Tree. Miss Twigley couldn't live in town, deal with regular folk around. Just like her, I hung lanterns, built a platform for a bed, and got my dog Sky. Sometimes me and Miller and Butterfly would talk about how we got here, them both beat near to death, being together women, mama holding me down for men, money for her gin, drugs. And now the government is bulldozing our homes like we're some kind of thugs, nobodies. Most of us can't even live inside walls. We got our reasons. Out on the bulb, the trails are gone that connected us. Miller and Butterfly have flown. I'm taking a fall. Twiggly's treehouse was my home. Me and my dog were lost at Gilman under the freeway. But nights, we sneak back to sleep by the tree. I need this peace, damn police. I am a bulb, a creative abundance, viable. I feel free to widen into the spectacular view, the protecting tree, my community. We occupy this place until the bulldozer evicts us, giving us a ride nowhere we want to go.
Thank you very much. Mark Turpin. And welcome back to Albany. Uh, I brought two poems. Um, one of them is a great um, takeoff on Frost um, that I'm not going to read. <laughs> but, uh, I'm just going to read one poem. Both of these poems are part of a new manuscript that was just accepted by Sarah Band, um, my second book. Um, the first book was called Hammer and was about mostly construction work. Um, and this book is called Every Man for Himself. Um, do you know what Banda is? Anybody? It's a brass based music, um, popular with um, Mexican American immigrants. Um, am I saying it wrong, John? Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm hanging on to my Anglo pronunciation of some of these words. So, um, Anyway, this is also another construction work poem. And um, it's called Little Rain Falling. And it's Little Rain Falling is a blues piece by Jimmy Reed, kind of a classic. Little Rain Falling. We have run with wet tools under the acacia, Rahelio and me, to watch the rain make mud in our trenches, drip off the strings and slide down the handles of left behind shovels, while the radio from under the wood hutch that we made for it hums Banda, which I play for Rahelio to keep him happy because I love him, I guess. Like a blues set to polka, a fatalism so ironic it's cheerful. Having something to do with the meaning of machismo for a world I don't live in, of three families in a house, unregistered, uninsured cars, and vague remembrances of a dusty home, yet is the only form of the masculine I know of left standing. Even gentle Rahelio has it. And he probably loves me now at 20 an hour with the love and mixed approbation one holds for the one who is telling you what to do and how to do it. Nothing. I take for granted love lightly being affinity's endurance of time. We have done this for years. We're only talking about the rain. Is it lighter now? Is it lightening up? Thinking about the bills to be paid, dollars per hour singing down the gutters of the rich who employ us. It's December, we too under the acacia, each in pessimistic reverie as downpour softens to shower. Me knowing, if only I suggest it, we'll go back out again to work in it, our boots squeezing mud, the little drops falling, finding our shirts, our skin beneath. Him laughing. Thank you. Katie Bailey. This is movie theater makeout sessions consume my soul. I feel your breath of knives, a serrated edge, carving away at my polluted skin, engraving your initials onto a soul and soul. Become me. This identity is a hollow hole. 
taste my immaculate frustration, and I will strip away the angst, the inquisition, the misconception, and the old jean jacket. My therapist is concerned. I have lost all inhibitions. I crave the bitterness of it all. Thank you, Katie. Peter Bulin. I, I think I'm going to develop the habit of naming the, the piece I read based on the atmosphere of the evening. So I'm, I'm going to call this somewhat trivial prose. <laughs> my, my girlfriend Alice came home early from work early, which was not like her. She had an unusual expression on her face. Having had girlfriends in the past, I wasn't exactly happy to see it. The unusual expression, that is. I've got news for you, she said. Oh, I said, kind of wishing I could turn the clock back to a time before unusual expressions and news. Yes, I just found out I'm going to be the next big thing, she said. At that moment, I wished like crazy I was a more developed person and could go ahead and congratulate her. But I myself had been waiting patiently, since childhood, in fact, to become the next big thing. And nothing had come of it. How did it happen, I asked. Well, just look at me, she replied. We'd been together for five years, so I'd pretty much seen her from every angle. But I was fairly certain that wasn't the type of thing she wanted to hear from me just then. Just look, she said again, with an air of confidence that had my insecurities start piling up a hundredfold. Was there an interview, I asked. She frowned. Of course not. Next big things are never tangled up in red tape, she said. What are they tangled up in, I asked, being genuinely curious. There were so many things that escaped me that went right over my head. Fame, she said, which is what I call a one-word answer. Alice seemed to know a lot about the subject, appeared to have a firm grip on it, which made me nervous in terms of what the future of my grip on Alice was going to look like. I chastised myself silently for not paying more attention in school, which had left me out to sea when it came to important areas of knowledge. It's all over the news, she said. I had an immediate fear of switching on any electronic device. What time did the story break, I asked, wanting to sound unflustered, journalistic, objective, scientific, all qualities I craved but couldn't locate. Around three, but I think in some secret way, it's been widely known for a long time. They've been keeping it under wraps so as not to hurt the feelings of the last big thing. They can spiral into depression, you know. I didn't know, but I wasn't the one with the college education. I'm so happy for you, I said, which was a bald-faced lie. I was a bale of misery hidden in a hayloft. All I had to look forward to now was her spiraling into depression. And who knew how far off that would be? Thank you, Peter. Kathleen McClure. That's fine. I'm Kathleen McClung. I'm going to read a sonnet from California Quarterly um, in honor of uh, Jean Wagner, the editor, whose work I so, so admire. The sonnet is titled, At the Marin Art Festival. She spies a vacant tent, vendor AWOL, and wonders, Kent Field silversmith, Larkspur soap artisan? Some crisis, thick, not small, has struck and freed a folding chair for her. She snags it, grateful for the shade, the view of Irish fiddlers on the stage, engrossed in jigs from County Donegal, and two blondes, forty-somethings, not quite overdosed on sound or sun or smack or all of the above, 
two whirling dervish babes, their rainbow hula hoops, hypnotic plastic rings, symbolic of some Zen koan, perhaps. The Celtic group, climaxed and coy, agrees to one encore. Her thoughts ebb exactly what she came here for. Thank you. Thank you. Dick Strong. Cowboy poet, yes? No, this was about Occupy, actually. Oh, great. Okay. You're remembering. Naivete. The establishment says of Occupy that they are naive. They disparage Occupy, saying these young activists lack sophistication and worldliness. Often they are charged with neglecting pragmatism in favor of moral idealism. But when the absurdities of a society look normal to the establishment, the remedies of dissent appear threatening. Then the rebels are monitored, infiltrated, and their cause discredited. At the barricades, the occupiers appear unkempt, disheveled, and uncouth. But in fact, it is the ideals of the establishment that are tawdry, squalid, and banal. Maybe, if there is a future, the naive will be seen as rational adapters, their moral idealism essential to survival. Thank you. Victor. This is called uh, To Physicality. What's called entropy, disorder, and decay, a winding down and out, is just a different order to the unencumbered eye. For even by your scheme, you must admit, my physical friend, all order once was dis, and all falling to a shambles is preceded by a falling to a semblance. So then, rid yourself of prejudice and preference for the fore or for the aft, and simply know whatever is familiar lessens so, so breezes stiffen to a blow and fall to calm, and a bomb by other circumstance may sting. Thus, this never final state of things and stuff is ample proof enough to sit aloof, unfavoring, and equanimous. For tack to port or, or come about, the master captain never slacks his tiller hand and never in a seeming chaos lies or crouches down an imperfection nor a doubt as outs to sea, when all your bodily desire succumbs, past fit or fart, you ever see, you ever were, and ever are, and ever are to be, the single presence in all alteration. So, oh, the master captain's us, the captain's we. So all winding downs, mere prejudice, Time tinted and silliness, mere silliness. Thank you, Steve Lane. I'm going to read a poem by someone else. <clears throat> uh, this is the most recent New Yorker. Um, this is a poem by James Richardson called Essay on Wood. At dawn, when rowboats drum on the dock, 
And every door in the breathing house bumps softly, as if someone were leaving quietly. I wonder if something in us is made of wood. Maybe not quite the heart knocking softly, or maybe not made of it, but made for its call. Of all the elements, it is happiest in our houses. It will sit with us, eat with us, lie down and hold our books, themselves a rustling woods, bearing our floors and roofs without weariness, for unlike us, it does not resent its faithfulness or question why, for what, how long. Its branchings have slowed the invisible feelings of light into vortices smooth for our hands, so that every fine-grained handle and page and beam is a wood word, a standing wave, years that never pass, vastness never empty, speed so great it cannot be told from peace. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ben Bartu. Oh. Hey, um, Ben. Uh, I just want to say thanks to everyone who read tonight, especially uh, Rebecca, Susan, Jean, and Roy. Is that all? Is that all right? Okay, great. Yes. And Susan Brown, wherever she may be. Yeah, okay. So this is a pretty short one. It's called Fast Food. A glade of sinews like shredded special barbecue pork. Wary, salt-eyed, the napalm men fly home. And on the brown, shit-caked ground, a moon-drawn Viet poet wonders if there is room for one more song in the archives of the eternal. Steel halved, meat halved, sea halved. He reaches for a country he could have lived in and drowns in the Indian Ocean, sinking like a stillbirth in rags to trenches darker and colder than he has ever known. Thanks. Thank you. All right, uh, Linda, I'm sorry, Ef Efros. This is a little poem that I wrote for a group of people that I met at a writer's retreat last summer, on the way home on the plane. When the heart sees the heart. Under this skin we own, beneath this cage of diverting bone, lives that surefire pump, that never sleeping warrior, driving us home, home. And on the way, against all laws of physics, through the opaque illusion of our separate selves, travels the light, the essence of the familiar stranger and comes quietly to dwell. Thank you. Toby Kaplan. After Robert Frost. Two roads converged within an open field. Hand me the air, the one less traveled. I have, made no, I have no idea what difference or understanding of how choices have been made or clearly drawn, no matter what destiny could be shaped into anyone's grief. All the people live in town, and I forgot my map. No one will see me watching what no one owns. Houses in confusion, another windy street with gardens, yards, acquaintances, an early loss of sight, as these woods fill up with snow, pages fill with words. 
Something there is that doesn't love a wall or a dog. Others teach you to love walls, to love your own desires without blame. But then you notice the dirt stubbles around cracks in the foundation, peeling paint like birch bark around the window frame. What can you miss keeping to yourself? What is yours to give? Just to please the neighbors and those who passed. The crows raving and stories covered something human. Three stones and a slate of marble. A shining surface reflects what we cannot speak of. Balancing and reasons for crows. Something determined and uncertain, yet alone. After a while, dying. In between we have the dogs, the fences, the summer morning fog, sunshine radiance on purple tongues of iris flowers. Thank you. Paul O'Curry. Number 18 repeats and repeats. Well, then I will just repeat and repeat. Normally, um, when I'm here, I read something that I write myself, but I thought the idea tonight was to, um, to grasp the idea of Robert Frost. Now, I was a very, sm I wasn't a very small child, but I was a young child when um, the Kennedy inaugura inauguration was there. And quite frankly, I was living in Ireland. I didn't know who the hell Robert Frost was, but I've learned a little bit more about him. But so I just picked up one of the sheets down there and I thought I can read one of these poems. So here we go. It's called Acquainted with the Night. I have been one acquainted with the night. I have walked out in rain and back in rain. I have outwalked the furthest city light. I have looked down the saddest city lane. I have passed by the watchman on his beat and dropped my eyes, unwilling to explain. I have stood still and stopped the sound of feet when far away an interrupted cry came over houses from another street. But not to call me back or say goodbye, and further still, at an unearthly height, one luminary clock against the sky, proclaimed the time was neither wrong nor right. I have been one acquainted with the night. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Your, your readings and recitations are always beautiful. Thank you. All right. Um, Larry Crispin. Can you hear me okay? This is my seventh poetry event in seven days. And I just had um, two poems translated into Russian again. It's not really a big deal, but this time I was able to get copies of them. And um, I have some new poems, but this one mentions Robert Frost, so I thought I'd read. It's called Midnight Class. I was thinking of this room when I started writing it, but I quickly went off a different direction. I went to a class late one night. The building, it was out of sight. The course price was such a deal, the teachers were a bit unreal. When in my poetry I was drowning, suddenly appeared Robert Browning. He was teaching us some rhyme. These days he has so little time. With him, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, at my prose she was frowning. She said I should summon a sonnet. Elizabeth said, that is not it. After midnight was Edgar Allan Poe. I love his raven, as you may know. He read his poem, Annabel Lee. It was so dark we could barely see. I looked into the ceiling vaulted. Is this place a little haunted? William Blake was so surreal. Blake's poetry has amazing zeal. Suddenly appeared William Shakespeare. He saw computers. How did they get here? Shakespeare offered some advice. Some was good, some not so nice. One class was Oakland's Garrett Murphy. 
He writes such humorous poetry, such biting political satire that my poetry book caught fire. The great local poet John Rowe, he is a writer that you may know. Combining Lao Tzu and Stephen Wright, we may dream to have his insight. From the past, Petrarch was our guest. He wrote of lore, as you have guessed. Between sonnets and haiku, this class may be just for you. Would you like to take the class, or afraid it may knock you on your ass? If you want to enroll, don't be late. There's a 300-year-long wait. On the road less traveled, we were lost. Their mending fences was Robert Frost. Someone asked him about free verse. As the roads diverged, he began to curse. With Virgil Homer and William Wordsworth, we really got our money's worth. Longfellow, John Dunn, and Ezra Pound, I do not know how this may sound. This was not your normal school, Pushkin and Chaucer in a carpool. One poet was Sylvia Plath. She hardly ever came to class. One night was Emily Dickinson. We were amazed that she might come. That class filled up so soon, she never even left her room. This was too much. We were confused. I decided it's better to choose to be protege to the great Christina and see Bob Dylan playing a concertina. I dreamed to write a villanelle. Then Dylan Thomas came up from hell. Dylan Thomas stumbled off to a bar. I drove straight home in my car. Thank you, Larry. All right, finally, David Rosenthal. And David is the person who coordinates and runs, hosts, First Wednesday Formal in Albany. And uh, our next reading will be in August, and if you enjoy Roy Mash, come and see him again in August at the, uh, at the church. Um, St. Albans, Albans, yeah. Thank you. So, uh, funny thing, I, I, you know, I should read things. I, I don't, and I didn't realize it was a Frost tribute, or, I mean, I, 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 sh I would have brought something. I, I can't think, really, of very many of my poems that aren't in some ways influenced by Frost, um, except this one that I brought. <laughs> so I'm going to try something, and I'll, I'll apologize ahead of time. I, um, Frost has played this role in my life, and part of that was the first poem I ever memorized, and probably the only one that stays. Um, I was 11. Why at 11 I picked this poem to memorize, I don't know. I had no idea what it meant, although I felt like I knew what it meant. Anyway, um, so I'm going to try from memory. Uh, choose something like a star. O star, the fairest one in sight, we grant your loftiness the right to some obscurity of cloud. It will not do to speak of night, since dark is what brings out your light. <clears throat> some mystery becomes the proud, but to be wholly taciturn in your reserve is not allowed. Tell us something we may learn by heart, and when alone, repeat. Say something, and it says, I burn. But say to what degree of heat, talk Fahrenheit, talk centigrade, use language we can comprehend. And it gives us strangely little aid, but does say something in the end. <coughs> Pardon me. As steadfast as Keats' Aramite, not even moving from its sphere, it asks of us a little here. It asks of us a certain height, that when, at times, the mob is, is swayed to carry praise or blame too far, we may choose something like a star to stay our minds on and be stayed. Oh, what a great and fitting way to end this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you for participating. And come back. Come back in September. We're taking a two-month break. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. And we send you off to Frost Place with all our good wishes. And we'll look forward to your adventures, your reports, your poems.
And thank you, Susan and Susan and Jean and Roy.